Good Sunday morning. It is May the 10th, 2020. Welcome to an online Bible study at Believers Baptist Church in Emory, Texas. The normal Sunday morning pattern for the members, friends, and guests at Believers Baptist Church is to gather in our sanctuary to worship the triune God through praise, prayer, and proclamation, always pointing to the cross, the symbol of the good news that Jesus Christ lived the life that we could never live and died the death that we deserve. And on the third day, he bodily rose from the grave and now sits at the right hand of God in heaven. That, my friends, is good news. And if you repent and believe in that good news, you will be saved from the wrath of God. And though this video Bible study is not a formal gathering of the Congregation of Believers Baptist Church, it is sufficient for the circumstances in which we find ourselves in following the recommendations for physical distancing during the coronavirus pandemic. There are, however, some of our congregation who are actually gathering at this 9.30 a.m. hour for the first in-person gathering of the church since March the 15th. And it is an outdoor lawn chair gathering and it is held in the front porch area and parking area of our family ministry building and of course it is being conducted according to the CDC guidelines. We will next Sunday, May the 17th at 10.30 a.m. have our first in-person gathering indoors again according to the CDC guidelines so be sure to check the church Facebook page and website for details before next Sunday, May the 17th. So I welcome all the members, friends, and guests to the Believers Baptist Church Facebook page. And then I also welcome all the members, friends, and guests who are listening on KRER 102.5. I'm thankful that we are able through technology to come to look at the same word together with the expectation that it will be profitable to our spiritual lives. So take your copy of Scripture, turn to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. We'll be looking at verses in chapter 1. However, and wherever you may be watching or listening, may God bless His Word to us this day. Let us pray and ask God for help in these days. And as is our custom, we will pray for a sister church and believers, uh, rather, in Rains County. And we will also pray for persecuted believers in Afghanistan. Father, you have provided for us a deliverer, a refuge, because you have sent your own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly offered his life for our sake on the cross. He is our strength, our song. He is our hope and joy. He is our blessed Redeemer. We embrace Him alone as our Savior. We trust in His life and death as fully sufficient to satisfy Your wrath against us. Father, we leave off any effort to gain for ourselves a righteousness that is acceptable to You. And we leave off any effort to supplement the work of the Lord Jesus on our behalf. We trust that He has done all things necessary for our salvation. And so we believe and ask this morning that you would keep us always near the cross. Lord, this morning I pray especially for the women of Believers Baptist Church and those who may be watching online or listening on the radio. I pray for them on this Mother's Day because they all have different circumstances and needs and experiences. And yet your grace is sufficient for each one of these women and for each and every circumstance. Give each of these women an assurance of your love, your peace, your hope. Give them both physical and spiritual strength. Give them ease in their burdens. Give them comfort in their pain, joy in their sadness, gain in their loss. Give them wisdom in their uncertainty. Give them help in their need. Bless and keep each one by your faithfulness and in your love. And this morning, Father, we pray for our sister church, Shady Grove Baptist Church. Lord, bless them, witness in the work of that church. Father, may they continue to be faithful and 
preaching and teaching the gospel. Use that church to reach many in this county that they might come to faith and understand the gospel through the witness of this church. Brother Wayne Wolf, Father, give him strength and help, especially as he leads that congregation, but even as he leads us as our county judge, Father, bless him with continued help in these days. And Lord, this morning we pray for the persecuted believers in Afghanistan. We pray that you would especially be near them, Lord. Protect them and keep them and the consequences and the circumstances that they find themselves, Father. Give them bold, holy testimonies. Give them courage in the midst of being rejected and despised, Father. Help them in every circumstance in need. And Father, I pray that a spiritual awakening would come to that nation because of the witness of those persecuted believers. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a wonderful day Mother's Day is. And it is certainly appropriate that we honor our mothers on Mother's Day and to remember, remember all that they have done and all that they do for us even now. Mothers are our first caregivers. They're our first teachers. They're our first examples. They're our first love. Most people would say that our mothers are the most influential person in their life. It is good that we set aside a day that we can remember and honor and thank our mothers. And yet, this is a day that can strike so much fear and anxiety and regret and guilt in the hearts, not only of mothers, but of women in general. This is a day when mothers feel that they must stand up and be measured by all the standards that are set forth about mothers in the Hallmark cards and in the songs and on the commercials and, and even in social media. It's a day when women are reminded of the pressures and their failures and reminded of their responsibilities and demands either as a wife or mother. And, and the reality is that as we come to this Mother's Day, what, all women are not in the same place. Uh, there are mothers whose own mother has passed from this life and they still feel that loss. They still grieve. There are some women who choose not to be mothers. There are those single women who desire to be married and become a mother. There are women who have experienced the sudden loss of a child. There are women who have experienced a miscarriage. There are stepmoms who are raising children that that they did not give birth to. They are, there are women who are waiting for the opportunity to adopt a, a child. There are mothers who have placed their children for adoption. There are, are mothers whose child was never birthed because of a choice that she made. And there are mothers who are estranged from their children, even on this Mother's Day. And I suppose the situations would be too many to count. But my point is not to think about every situation, but my point is to think about Mother's Day and the joy and the blessing that it is to recognize our mothers, to honor them, but it also has its own memories and sorrows and emotions and, and troubles with it. And because this is true, it's really one of the harder days to think about preaching and teaching and delivering a, a sermon. For a pastor because a pastor doesn't want to be insensitive he doesn't want to cause unnecessary guilt or cause shame or regret uh, but neither does he want to lessen the the grace and the joys of motherhood and so with this in mind my aim in this sermon is to generally recognize motherhood but specifically and briefly to emphasize some of the biblical realities of the Bible's teaching on God and the family. And so there are truths that we want to consider. In fact, there are three truths that we'll consider from the text that we're going to look at. And these truths are always true regardless if you're a mother or if you're not a mother, if you're a father or if you're not a father, whatever the circumstance and social status and setting and experiences of your life, these truths will always be true. They're applicable to every person, to every believer, because at some point your life is intersected with these three truths. And so our text this morning is Proverbs chapter 1, and we're going to just look at two verses, verses 8 and 9, verses 8 and 9 of Proverbs 
chapter 1. I'm using the English Standard Version. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and penance for your neck. In those two verses, there are three principles that I will draw our attention to as we think about God and the family. The first principle or truth is this, that the family is God's idea. The family is God's idea. You see, this principle is anchored really in verse 8 of our text. The family is clearly seen here because of the people that are named. There is a son, there is a father, and there is a mother. This is the biblical example of a family. Now I know that there are exceptions and families can be defined or explained by having widowed uh, parents or widowed uh, uh, spouse trying to raise a child and there are exceptional circumstances I realize that but this becomes then for us the biblical understanding and definition of what a family is uh, we read about this in Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 and 28 God created man in his own image in the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. That was the beginning of the family. God's idea. The family is one male, one female, who are image bearers of God. That is, they reflect God in the creation, in their respective and unique persons and characteristics and strengths that they would each have definite roles and those roles would complement one another and they would be able to fulfill God's command as a family to fulfill or rather to be fruitful multiply and fill the earth and subdue it now, and mankind is to continue the work of creation, if you will. It is to continue to work in such a way that God's command in Genesis 1, 27 and 28 is fulfilled. This instruction that is given to us about the family in Proverbs 1, verse 8 is very clear. It's a father and a mother and a son. And the foundation of this particular family unit and all family units is found in Genesis chapter 2. The summary of marriage is given to us in verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Genesis 2 24. And, and much more could be said about this but it's important that every believer know and understand that this is the biblical idea of the family. There are no other definitions, there are no other explanations, there are no other options or possibilities, there are no other realities of the family in terms of the biblical model that is given to us and there is no higher authority so no one can change this. There's no entity, there's no agency, there's no group, there's no government can define the family as they want without incurring for themselves the circumstances or I say the consequences of judgment against themselves. And so this then becomes for us an understanding on this Mother's Day and a thinking again rightly about the family. We are so bombarded in our culture about what a family ought to be and how it can be explained and defined by cultural ideas. That is not what we need to hold to. We need to hold to, on this Mother's Day, come back to the reality, the truth, that the family is God's idea. But there's a second truth here that I want us to think about. That is that the family is the basic school for instructing children how to live in this world. That's right. The family is the basic school. Not the public school system that we have in our nation, but the family is the basic school for instructing children on how to live in this world. Did you notice what it said as we read those two verses from our text? Hear, my son, your father's instruction and your mother's 
teaching. You see, the parents were responsible and accountable to teach or disciple their children. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, Paul in writing about Timothy said, I am reminded of your sincere faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And in verse 9 we see that if the son hears and applies the instruction of his father and the teaching of his mother, then his life will be adorned with peace and security and calm. It, it will be beautified. It will be adorned by the representation of a garland on the head or a pennant around the neck. But this has always been God's plan. It is our duty as parents to take seriously the responsibility and the role for teaching our children. And both father and mother share in this responsibility of teaching and instructing. They both have responsibility to disciple their children. Your children will be discipled. They will be discipled by Disney. They will be discipled by secular humanism. They will be discipled by the popular music of the culture or sports in the culture. But your children will learn. They will be formed by who has the most influence in their life. This is why God gave the responsibility to the parents. God has designed that the parents should be the main disciplers teachers of their children. And this certainly would include the gospel. Uh, the good news of the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, and yet suffered and died as though he had committed sin, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he is going to come and judge the living and the dead. Teach your children that good news, but teach your children about God through the framework of what His Word says about creation or through the framework of what God's Word says about redemption. That's the, that's the, 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 the way, the format, that's the, the instruction that you ought to give to your children. It is through the lens of of God's word concerning creation through the lens of God's word concerning redemption. Uh, teach your children to think about the important questions of life. Uh, don't let others ask them the questions that you should be asking. Uh, for example, even in this moment in our lives, you could be asking your children questions about how do we think about the coronavirus? How do we think about sin and judgment? during this coronavirus? How do we think about how we ought to respond as believers during this coronavirus? You sit down with them. I think about Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 where Paul, rather God says to the Israelites, this is how you ought to teach your children my commands. And that is that you shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. That was good for ancient Israel, but it's also good for modern day Christian America, or Christians in America. It is a good word to us. Parents, teach your children. Now I noticed, I know rather that, that uh, it's intimidating. I know it's scary, and I know it can seem like it's an impossible task. But, but I want you to think with me, because nowhere in the text does it say that you have to do this perfectly, because it will be messy. I have personal successes in this, and I have personal failures. I am not the example that you would typically or, and want to follow, necessarily. I want to do these things, but my life is messy, and so I have not done this perfectly. And you will not do it perfectly. But there's no expectation that you do it perfectly. Second, in the text, there's no specific format or lesson plan for you to follow. How you teach your children and your family will be different than how I taught my children and my family. 
Third, there's no special requirement in the text for the parents to meet before they disciple their children. In other words, there's no necessity for a theological degree. There's no necessity for having all of the biblical doctrines nailed down in your understanding before you start teaching your children. You disciple them. Uh, listen, this is why we want to help as the church. It's not the responsibility of the government to disciple your kids. It is not the responsibility of the church to disciple your kids. It is that the church can come alongside and help. Yes, the government can come alongside and help. Perhaps we can teach skills and techniques and particular or certain disciplines. But the church is to come alongside the parents in teaching their children. And the children then are to learn their father's instruction and their mother's teaching. This is why we have hired Jared to do what he's done and what he has done an exceptional job for us in the last three years is not to have the typical Southern Baptist youth ministry. We can't compete with entertaining teenagers with the culture. We can't compete with the culture in entertaining your teenager. But we can come alongside you as you instruct and teach your children. And that's why we've put emphasis on Jared's job description to work alongside our families, to give himself to our families. Yes, he does have work that he does with our student ministry. Does a fine job there. I appreciate what Jared does. And I hope you recognize as members of Believer's Baptist Church what he is doing. And he is been willing to come alongside and, and help families. He is not the perfect mother or, or rather father and Whitney is not the perfect mother. They're not the perfect family. It's messy but they're doing this and they are willing and graciously offering their help to you to do this. This is why we created the Faith at Home Resource Center so that we can offer resources that would be helpful to you as you do this. And the Resource Center is full of all kinds of good things that can help. Take the time to go buy the Resource Center, the Faith at Home Resource Center, and look at those resources that are there to help you teach your children. So, truth number one, the family is God's idea. Truth number two, the family is God's school for teaching your children how to live in this world. And then the third truth that I would mention to you this morning is that sons and daughters are expected to be submissive to their fathers and mothers. There's two commands that are given to the son in this text. Hear and forsake not. The son in this text is to hear his father's teaching and he is not to forsake his mother's instruction. That is, he is to pay attention. This is to be something that he applies to his life because if he does not do that, there will be temporal consequences. And in fact, if you began reading in verses 10 through 19, you would see what those temporal consequences are. That is, hanging with the wrong crowd in particular. And the consequences that come with hanging with the wrong crowd. Ephesians 6 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. <coughs> Colossians 3 20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So the family is God's idea. And the family is God's school for instructing your children how to live godly lives in this world. And third, sons and daughters are expected to be submissive to their fathers and their mothers. <coughs> it is so true, and I wish we had time that we could look more closely at those temporal consequences that are laid out in verses 10 through 19 of Proverbs chapter 1. Those consequences would come to those who refuse to hear their parents. And those consequences are dead, deadly and dangerous, certainly. But more than that, they cause eternal consequences because they cause eternal 
an everlasting um, separation from God. They they cause and bring upon these rebellious sons or daughters the just judgment of God unless they repent, unless they believe. And, and the text that we are looking at it's not just specifically talking about that son and those temporal consequences, but it's talking about all sons, all daughters, and any temporal consequence. So would you be willing to hear your parents' instruction? Would you be willing to go a step further and hear God's instruction through your parents that you might Preserve your life, not only temporal, but eternally. Would you be willing to recognize that you're a sinner? That you have offended a holy God? That your rebellion and your unwillingness to obey and hear and heed God's instruction through your parents, your unwillingness to honor them, your unwillingness to honor God, your unwillingness to hear Him has put a separation between you and God. And there's no way that that separation can be reconciled except through faith in Christ alone. By God's grace alone, in the faith alone that you can put in the Son alone, you can be saved. And be saved from the eternal consequences of unwillingness to hear instruction. Don't be a fool. Later on in the book of Proverbs, the fool is described as one who is unwilling to hear and to heed the instruction that is given to him. And then parents, let me just say a word to you, particularly the Christian parents who have heard this message on this Mother's Day and you feel like you're failing or you feel guilty, you feel remorse, uh, you feel like that you have not done a good job as a parent instructing and discipling your children, start afresh. I, I get it. I do. And know that God's grace is sufficient for you. You don't have to despair. You don't have to feel guilty. The, the work of salvation has been accomplished for your children in Christ. Pray for your children to be saved. And then do everything that's necessary to create an environment in which they hear the gospel. And then do everything that is necessary and be diligent at it to create a, an environment in which through the lens of God's word about creation or through the lens of God's word about redemption, they learn how to live godly lives. You live a godly life. They'll pick up on it. They'll learn from you. Disciple your children. Don't delegate it to the government school. And I'm not trying to be an offense against public school or public school teachers. I, I thank God that we have many in our local school district that are believers. Some of those teachers are even in our own congregation. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm saying that the main responsibility is for you as a parent to teach your children. Take heart. Take courage. Fathers, lead your family. With that being said, I just want to thank all of you on this Mother's Day for tuning in and listening. Perhaps to get on the radio or via the Facebook page. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the love of Christ Jesus, the grace of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.